thank God for who he is. Amen. And uh, that song is true. There's power in the name of Jesus. And when Sister Becky was think, singing it, it, notice it says to break every chain. Didn't say some chains. Didn't say most chains. Didn't say 99% of chains. It says every chain. Every chain. Their testimonies may not be here, but of people that were bound by drugs, or alcohol, pornography, and all kind of chains, and they said that Jesus delivered them. That's the Lord that we serve. Thank God. He, he is a deliverer. He breaks every chain. Depression, he's done it. He's done it. And he'll do it again because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. That was the other thing I was thinking about when I came here is that how fortunate we are to serve a God that doesn't change. You're, you may be feeling different than you were last week, Sunday, when you were here. Maybe something happened during the week. And maybe last week something good happened. So when you came to Sunday, you were on top of the world. Maybe this Sunday something happened, maybe yesterday or whatever, and you're feeling a little low, you're still worshiping. But God doesn't change. He was the same when you were on t- you felt on top of the world or you feel that you're on the bottom of the world today. You feel like you are not on top of the rock, but under the rock. He's still the same. He's still the same. One of the things, uh, uh, an analogy I like to use is, you know when, no matter, uh, you were snowing last night, no matter how cloudy it is or cold it is, do you know that the sun is still shining? It's still hot as hot as it, is, as it was before? How much more the Lord that you and I serve and that's pretty good. Amen? Praise God. Praise God. Um, you know, in the scripture, uh, in uh, Proverbs 6, uh, verse 6, it says, to Go to the ant, you sluggard, consider her ways and be wise, which having no captain, overseer, or ruler, provides her supplies in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. Are you familiar with that scripture? You know, and I was thinking how... Uh, how God is, how the, the Spirit of God used an insect, an ant, that you may be walking and, and step on it and you, and you didn't even realize it. Yet he used that simple insect to teach uh, a powerful truth, right? And we're going to do that, t- we're going to continue to do that today. Um, it's not an ant, but uh, uh, Brother AJ, you can put up that. Can you see that? That's a mule or a donkey. I, I think it's a mule. And, and I think we are, uh, I don't know about this generation, at least when I was growing up, you'd hear this statement, that person is as stubborn as a mule. Have you heard that? And the, the, I did a little research. They say, actually, that's not, that the, the mule is not really stubborn, but it may think that, let's say it's, you're, it's about to cross a puddle or the, the, the um the trainer, whoever's riding it, or it sees the puddle, it's thinking, I don't know how they determine that, it's thinking it's something worse. And so it's saying, I'm not going anywhere, and it's trying to go around. But for the sake of the message, just look at that as being stubborn, right? You notice that there's a guy trying to pull it, and there's a guy trying to push it, and it's not going anywhere. I also look, you see, uh, that, that mule doesn't know. Maybe they're trying to bring it to that water. Maybe he's thinking that water is going to drown. Maybe they're thinking, no, we need to get you there to give you a bath or to give you something to drink. But the bottom line, it's being stubborn. And that's the message. The title of the message is don't be stubborn. Don't be, don't be stubborn. And it's taken from um, 1 Samuel 15, 23. It says, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king. And if you know the story, it's in regards to King Saul. God had called him, asked um, you, Samuel, to anoint him to be king. And God had a plan for his life. But um, and, uh, the word of the Lord came unto Samuel to tell Saul to go and kill, uh, to destroy 
um, this uh, nation. And, they, he, and, and he said, destroy everything, even the animals. Wipe them out. Well, King Saul, he destroyed the, the, uh, the enemy, the enemies. He destroyed most of the animals and kept the good ones, right? And so when, Sam, when um, Samuel now came, he, Saul goes out to meet him and said, hey, I, I've done what the Lord commanded. And then Samuel said, then why am I he- not hearing all this bleating of sheep? You were told to destroy everything. And then he says, well, um, Sam, Saul says to Samuel, well, you know, I did it because we want the people, we wanted to offer sacrifice to the Lord. And you know the story where, where that there were, uh, now Samuel said, you know, it means more to God to obey than to sacrifice. And in, then this is where ver, verse um, 23 comes in. For rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft and stubbornness, as in the King James, as iniquity and idolatry and because you rejected the word of the lord he's also rejected you from being king stubbornness is not good it cost saul the anointing his kingship the lord took it away and if you read you know the story you know your bible it was now turned over to uh david because of disobedience because of stubbornness now notice it says um that is stubbornness is as iniquity and iniquity Iniquity refers to premeditated choice. It's sin, but it's sin that you plan or sin that goes unrepented. It's called um, iniquity. In Micah 2 verse 1, it says, says, Woe to those who plan iniquity, to those who plot evil on their beds. At morning's light, they carry it out because it is in their power to do it. In, and then we read in David, you remember in, in the Psalm of David when this is, this, has to, this is referring to when King David had sinned with Bathsheba, had committed um, adultery, and he tried to cover it up by killing his, um, her husband, right? And now he's, he's now called on it. The, the prophet Nathan said that, you know, you've, you've done wrong. And um, the, notice the difference between Saul and David. When David was told that he sinned, he said, you know, you're right. I'm paraphrasing. He said, yes, I have sinned. The difference with Saul now, he's, he's making excuses. You know, I'm, the reason why I, we're offering up, the, we, we, we kept the best part of the animals to offer up as, as a sacrifice. Stubbornness will do that, will cause you to uh, make excuses. That's not valid. Now, um, going back to David in Psalm 52, excuse me, 1 verse 2, it says that he's praying to God. And he says, wash away all of my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Right? He submitted himself to the Lord. Very different than what Saul, Saul did. Now we also, it's, uh, the scripture also said in verse 23, that not only is stubbornness as iniquity, but also as idolatry. And of course, you know, idolatry is you know, somebody's worshiping idols, or if you put something before God, and that becomes an idol in your life. And that's so God, God is saying, listen, stubbornness to me is as do these two things. It may not be to you, but one of the things we've, I've learned is that God doesn't see the way man sees. Amen? Because remember, in one of the epistles, it says, um, if you hate your brother, you're a murderer. That means your sister, too, in the Lord. Right. If you but if you it, it, let's let's say for just for um, just to sake an argument, you are somewhere and your sister in Christ said, you know, you did something. And says, I hate you. And you picked up the phone and called 911 and said, I want to report a murder. And they're going to say, well, where, who? And he says me. And then they're going to know that it's, that can't be you. You're alive. You're right. But yet and and they, that wouldn't even make it to court. Much, much more thrown out of court. As a matter of fact, you probably would get in trouble with the law for calling um, something as false, right? Yet, God says, if you hate your brother or your sister, you are a murderer. And he goes as far as to say that, and you know that no murderer has eternal life dwelling in them. You see? So God doesn't see things the way man sees it. So what we need to do is see the way he sees it and then apply it into our life. 
Because then you maybe think you're doing well, and God says, no, you're not doing well. It's on his terms, not on your terms. And that's one of the problems is, you see, remember the scripture says, if you judge yourself by others, you're unwise. You have to use the word of God to judge yourself. Is not so? Amen. Praise God. So, idolatry. That's, uh, God looks at stubbornness as iniquity and as idolatry. Now, stubbornness, if somebody is stubborn, that person is determined not to change their opinion or um, uh, no matter what, even if it's wrong, they're, gonna, they're holding on to it. Notice that the key thing is that even then they know it's wrong, but they say, I'm not budget. This is my decision, and I'm going through with it. That's stubbornness. I remember some years ago, I, I went to uh, um, this guy's house. I actually went to counsel him. He was uh, once serving the Lord, but had backslidden. And somebody asked me, please go talk to him. So, okay, I went. And I sat and I spoke to him. He listened to me. He agreed with everything I said. Then he turned to me and he said, you know, I'm stubborn. I couldn't help him. I mean, what can you do? If somebody tells you, if somebody tells you they're stubborn and not willing to change, you can't help the person because they're not, they're not going to go forward. They're gonna, they, and to this day, that person, as far as I know, is not serving the Lord. And I remember a, a woman some years ago, a Christian woman, told me, she said, you know, the reason why I'm not married is because I'm stubborn. And then she said, all of my family is like that. Isn't that sad? That's something you, you and but but notice one of the things I've been noticing. If you're stubborn, you know it. You may not you may not say it, but deep down you know you're stubborn, and um, don't think of it as a personality trait. Especially as become when we become Christian, all that stuff is supposed to go aside because the Lord said that if if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And you, uh, so, but that doesn't mean that you won't be tempted. You see, when you become a Christian, when you give your heart to the Lord, yes, it's a done deal, but you have to walk in that light. You can still, God doesn't take away your choice just because you're saved. You still have a choice. You still can go out and do what's wrong. But, God's, but because of the new man now, your spirit has been born again. You know, as Paul said, as you once yielded yourself to the things of the flesh, now that you, are, as you yield yourself to sin when you didn't know Christ, now that you know the Lord, yield yourself to righteousness. Amen. Don't be stubborn. Don't be stubborn. i um, give you another uh, incident. Some years ago, I was listening to a, a, a minister, and he said that... Um, his brother-in-law, and to be his brother, that means he's married to his sister, right? Or anyway, he was married to his sister, and he, he, the sister said, please talk to my husband. Because see, what he was doing, he, was, he would go away for a while and just leave the family and get into just sin. Wasn't doing right. So this minister now went and went, spoke to him. He began to, the, the man began to cry and said, you know, it's true and I'm going to change. What you're saying is right. But you know, he didn't change. He did not change. And by and by, some tragedy came in his life. And the minister, uh, remember, that's his brother-in-law. He got in his knees to pray. And you know that he said that the Lord said, don't you dare call his name before me. I don't want to hear his name. He has been given chance after chance and after chance and he won't change. You say, God God's not like that. Well, you know, in, this, in Proverbs 29, verse 1, it says, He that being often reproved, hardeneth his neck, shall suddenly be destroyed, and, this, and that without remedy. And that last part, to me, is the saddest. Because it's not just destroyed, but that it's without remedy. There's nothing you can do. It's over. It's over. That's sad. So you can, it, 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 you can get it to the point. The point where, you know, the Lord has been saying, I've, been, I've sent this person. I've done this. I've revealed myself in a dream. I've warned them this way, and they just won't listen. Like, it may be to the extreme, but it happens. Now God is saying, I, I don't, don't, he told the minister, don't call his name before me. I'm not going to listen. That's a sad place to be. We don't want to be there. 
don't be stubborn. In Jeremiah um, 7, verse 23 says, But this is what I command them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you will be my people. You will walk in all the way which I command you, that it may be well with you. Verse 24, Yet they did not obey or incline their ear, but walked in their own counsels, and in, their, in the stubbornness of their evil heart, and went backward and not forward. See? Stubbornness. They wouldn't listen. God doesn't want us to. God don't want us to be like that. He wants us to listen, to be yielded to him. Right? Amen. Now, in, if you, you go throughout um, the book of Exodus, you will find this word stiff-necked, which all, it's, it's synonymous. It means, uh, also means um, stubborn. For example, Exodus 32, 9 says, And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people. And behold, it is a stiff-necked or stubborn people. Uh, Exodus 33, 3, Unto a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in the midst of thee, for thou art a stiff-necked people, or a stubborn people, lest I consume me, soon thee in the way. Exodus 33, 5, And the Lord said uh, unto Moses, Say unto the children of Israel, Ye are a stiff-necked people or a stubborn people. Uh, Exodus 34, 9 says, And he said, If now I have found grace in thy sight. This is Moses talking to the Lord. He says, O Lord, let, let my Lord, I pray thee, go among us. For it is a stiff-necked people or a stubborn people. And pardon our iniquity and our sin and take us for thy inheritance. Deuteronomy 9, 6 says, Understand, therefore, that the Lord thy God giveth thee not this good land to possess it for thy righteousness. For thou art a stiff-necked or stubborn people. In other words, God was saying, listen, Moses, God was saying to Moses, you know, the Lord promised you this promised land. Now you're about to enter in it, into it with all of the milk and honey and all of the... Uh, you know, the niceties. But don't you dare think that God's doing this because you were good or you were righteous. Because no, he said, you are stubborn people. You are stiff-necked people. And the only reason why the Lord is doing it because he loves you and the promise that he made to Abraham. See? Don't be stubborn. Amen? Deuteronomy 9, 13. Furthermore, the Lord spake unto me, saying, I have seen this people, and behold, it's a stiff-necked people or a stubborn people. Deuteronomy 10, 16 says, Circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of your heart, and be no more stiff-necked or stubborn. Second Chronicles 38. You see, and I'm going through all this to show you how much it talks about being stubborn. We don't talk about that so much today, but it's a serious thing. It's in Second Chronicles 38, 30, verse 8 says, Now be ye not stiff-necked or stubborn as your fathers were, but yield yourselves unto the Lord and enter into his sanctuary, which he has uh, sanctified forever, and serve the Lord your God, that the fierceness of his wrath may turn away from you. Somebody may say, well, you know, you've just given me all kinds of, you know, we're under the new covenant now. You've just, you know, talked about um, stiff-necked or stubbornness in the Old Testament. Well, I give you one in the New Testament. Acts 7, verse 51 says, "Ye, this is um, Stephen talking to the people. He said, ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. That's New Testament. God doesn't want us to be stubborn. He wants us to be yielding to him. You know, I read an article, and I'm going to read a part of it. Um, There's a woman, 25 years old, uh, in regards to being stubborn. Just to see how stubbornness is like a cancer. It's not good. And as children of God, we should have no part to do with it. It says, um, this this is part portion of what she said. He says, it's taken a whole 25 years for me to realize that my stubbornness is my own worst enemy and has been all my life. For one, it's crippling, especially to relationships. 
When you're stubborn, you don't apologize under any circumstance. Even when you're dead wrong and you know it, it becomes a mental and physical impossibility. There's been times that I wanted to apologize, but the words literally wouldn't leave my mouth. Sorry sits at the tip of my tongue and burns me up from the inside, but I won't say it. Even in situations where sorry could have saved me, my stubbornness would rather let me drown. When you're unable to express regret, it starts to fill you up inside. And listen to this. And holding onto it is like keeping something spoiled in your refrigerator. And you know it needs to be disposed of. But it sticks around until it rots and sours your space with its foulness. That's her admitting. And the sad thing, it took her 25 years to realize that. Imagine that. And you know, um, God's saying to us, don't be stubborn. Even in in our homes, you know, things happen in families. There can be, uh, you know, a, a, a disagreement. And, 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 and that flesh we're going to want to rise up. That's why it's so important. Can't emphasize enough to be uh, praying for, be, always be praying and stay close to the Lord. Because your flesh is going to want to come up. And your flesh, you can't get the, you can't tame your flesh. You know that? You know, there's some wild beasts. You, you've read stories of, um, um, uh, some years ago, there was a, uh, I think there were in this, there was a guy, he was a trainer in the circus, and so-called this, uh, this, this um, lion. It's supposed to be trained, and he did something, and the lion lunged at him, almost killed him. And then the, the, the article was saying, you got to always remember, it's a wild beast, no matter what you do. And the flesh is like that. You can put makeup on it. You can do all kind of stuff. It's still the flesh. That's why the scripture says, Paul said, walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Right? The flesh may do something and it's seemingly good, but check it out. There's an ulterior motive of evil behind it. And he may even fool you. So be aware. God says, be on your guard. Peter said that. Be watchful because your adversary as a roaring lion Go for about seeking who may devour. And you know how a roaring lion, what it does, I believe uh, was um, Sister Becky a few weeks ago was preaching and mentioned about a lion, how it, 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 how it follows its prey. And all of a sudden, when that lion, maybe, it was, maybe that animal is drinking some water, and then the lion said, it's dinding time, and it goes after it. And, and in the scripture is saying that, um, that Satan is like that. He's like a roaring lion, seeking who he may devour. And who was Peter talking to when he said, um, be sober and be vigilant? He wasn't talking to the world. He was talking to you and I. That means it's possible for us not to be vigilant. Not to, uh, it's, part of, it's possible for us to get sleepy, spiritually sleepy or drowsy. He's warning us, don't do that. So you, don't, you can't go and say, well, because I'm saved now, I'm all set. You're all set if you do what the Word says. You're all set if you walk in obedience with the Lord. You're all set if you yield to Him. You're all set if you put stubbornness aside and says, Lord, here I am. Do what you want through me. You've got to live. We have to live that way or else we're going to have problems. And you know another thing about stubbornness, if you can put that picture back up there, Brother AJ. Another thing about stubbornness, it it will stop your spiritual growth because you're not moving. You ain't going, you're not going anywhere. And you may say, but I'm still praying, but you're not moving. God wants to take you higher, but it could be stubbornness that's causing you or causing us to go to that next level. And so we got to put it aside and just yield and say, Lord, have your own way, not my way. See, that's part of the problem is sometimes we ch- oh, we're trying to, well, this is what I feel or this is the way I am. Well, when you become a Christian, that's supposed to change. I'm not that way anymore. You know, people say, that I've said this over the years, you know, Nehemiah, oh, he's so easygoing and he's so laid back, you know, and, that's, and as if to say that's my personality or that's me. But you know what? If they only knew who I was when I didn't know the Lord. I came to the Lord at 
14, right? But did you know, I'm pretty sure some of my family members didn't know. I used to get into fights. I had a fight with a guy who pulled a knife on me. And I didn't back down. I, I remember, in, and this was when I was in junior high school. I used to get into fights. I was in a mini gang. I don't broadcast it, but I was. I'm, my parents didn't know because I was the kind of guy... Because of my parents were strict, you act good at home. But as soon as you go to school, you're a total different person. You see? So, you know, I, so when people say, oh, he's just so nice. It's not me. It's the Christ that's in me. Because I didn't used to be like that. I'm telling you the truth. I didn't. But, you know, when the Lord comes in and you, you, you really yield to him and says, Lord, just do it. God, just do it. Do it. Just operate on me. Do whatever you want. Do whatever you want. But see, some of us, we say, okay, Lord, just do whatever you want, but don't, don't, just just forget about my toe. My toe is fine. Or, Lord, do do whatever you want, but don't touch my arm. That's not yielding. That's partial yielding. And then the part that you don't yield to the Lord, trust me, you're going to have a problem with that area. The Lord wants all of us. Spirit, soul, and body. Lord, I belong to you. Remember the Bible says that your, our bodies is, uh, is the temple of the Holy Spirit, of the Holy Ghost. Uh, and then he says that, know ye not that your, your body is the temple of God. You belong to him. And he says that if you divide, defile that temple, then what, what are you doing? You, def, you, you are defiling what God owns. God said, I will walk in them. I will be in them. Hallelujah. And when we realize, re- really recognize who we have living on the inside, we're going to do our best to say, Lord, just do, I'm going to live a clean life. I'm not going to do this. I'm going to submit. And you know, going back to what this, wo- this woman that had this problem, I don't know if she was a Christian, if she, um, uh, but she said she had problems saying sorry. How many of us can have that? That's the, of the flesh. But once we become saved, that should change. You know, I've learned the best way to deal with that. Something happens and you need to say sorry. Don't, don't wait. Do it right away. Get it done. Because the longer you wait, it's going to be harder. Remember the Bible says that you shouldn't let the sun go down with your wrath. It's in the Old Testament, but it's also in the New Testament. Don't let the sun go down your wrath. You know, just make up. Say, you know, I'm sorry. Even if the other person don't accept it, because that person may be upset with you, at least you did your part. As uh, our pastor mentioned on uh, Wednesday in our Bible study, do your part. At least you're free with God and with that person. Whether the person won't accept it or not, that's not your problem. At least you, you apologize and say, yeah, you know, I shouldn't have said that. Or And let's go even further than that. Didn't Paul say that, wouldn't you rather just take the wrong? Sometimes, you know, you know you're right. You know, but then for peace's sake, for argument's sake, for just say, you know, let the person, just let them feel that they're right, even when you know that they're dead wrong. I remember some years ago, uh, this happened to me. I won't go into all the details, but because, again, it goes back to how people look at me and say, oh, he's just... Easy going. My wife knows about it. Matter of fact, we were talking about it when she was in Nigeria. And it was, it was an invitation somewhere. And the person was upset because I didn't invite them, even though it was an open invitation. So she said, just play the fool. And that's what I did. I just played the fool. I still invited them, you know, and I didn't have to. I made believe that I was the one who was dumb. To this day, they don't know. Because the thing is, I realized if I was to really say that what I could have said, it would probably really ruin our friendship. And I said, no, it's not worth it. So let them think that. <laughs> let them think that. What's the big deal? God knows you're right. See, that's the thing, too. When you know that, uh, when you're just trying to please God, it changes everything, you know. Because then it doesn't matter if somebody think you're winning or losing. It has nothing to do with that. As long as God knows and he's the one, he's being pleased, then it's okay. Let the, let the person think that you're dumb, you're crazy. Didn't Paul say, be a fool for Christ? Right? Be a fool for Christ. 
But then if you're a fool for Christ, in God's eyes, you're wise. You're wise. Amen. Amen. I started out the message I'm about to close. Remember I mentioned about how God sometimes like, it would use, even like in this case, an insect and something it seems to be insignificant, an ant, and yet a powerful lesson. God doesn't want us to be like that mule. And you can run that, uh, Brother AJ. This is what he wants us to be. See that galloping horse? And then you can stop it now. And you may say, that's just a, a um, uh, you can turn it off. And just freeze it like that. What a difference between that and that mule. Remember that mule or that uh, wasn't going anywhere? But that horse is yielded to, let's call that her master. And just do whatever you want with my life. And, and that horse is going somewhere, right? And it may seem well, just a, no, it's not a silly analogy. Sometimes we need those simple things. It stays with us. I guarantee you're not going to forget. And when the temptation comes for you to be stubborn, says, no, I'm not going to do that. Because I'm not, it's not going to help me. It's not getting me anywhere. Don't be stubborn in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand, please.